Hello, everyone, and, and welcome. I'm Dermot Kelleher. I'm Vice President of Health here at UBC. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the University of British Columbia's Vancouver Point Grey campus is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And the Okanagan campus is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Silks people. I'd also like to acknowledge that UBC's activities take place on indigenous lands throughout British Columbia and beyond, and that many of you are joining us from different parts of the province, and we acknowledge the traditional guardians and caretakers of these lands. Now I'll tell you a little bit about UBC Health. The purpose of UBC Health is to enable interprofessional and collaborative health education, and also to catalyze interdisciplinary research. And our aim is to harness the collective power and wisdom of the UBC community to address inequities and improve the systems that foster and support health. We do this by encouraging and supporting collaborations across disciplines and faculties at UBC's Vancouver and Okanagan campuses. And engagement, of course, with communities, institutions, and organizations throughout BC. Now, I think as all of us will realize, our understanding of the determinants and outcomes and experiences of health and well being has changed radically over the last uh, uh, period. In 2020, the COVID pandemic accelerated existing trends and put a spotlight on others. But most importantly, it forced us to change the way that we think and to change the way that we act in terms of health uh, at a provincial, a national and international level. And we're now faced with both the challenge and the opportunity of responding to the broad effects of the pandemic. And indeed, it's an extraordinary time. I think we're just seeing so many paradigms changing, so many, uh, so many paradigms breaking apart. And this is a, a time in the history of health where there is a real new opportunity to shape the future in many, many different ways. So right now we have an opportunity to learn from our collective experience and an opportunity to think differently, uh, to think about how we define and value health, how we understand the complex systems that produce health and how we rise to the challenges of supporting equity in health across individuals, communities and societies. So in response to this opportunity, UBC Health is launching Health After 2020, which is an initiative designed to support new conversations across the disciplines, to encourage new research collaborations, and to find new ways of creating and sharing knowledge with everyone. As people will know, the pandemic, Black Lives Matters, and the finding of 215 bodies of children on the grounds of a former residential school in Kamloops underlines how far the old normal was really from normal and how that old normal was failing so many people in our communities in terms of health. And health after 2020 is our contribution to building a, a new normal that acknowledges and addresses our failings, but also sees new opportunities to improve health and well-being for everyone. And uh, I would just say, say a particular word uh, that uh, it's really thanks to the prescience of, of Kim McGrail here, who, who conceived of this concept at an early stage uh, and, and, and thought about how to bring this concept to fruition. And I really want to acknowledge that the, the, the uh, imagination and the innovation that Kim has brought to this, uh, to, to this dialogue. It's really, really important but it's so, it's so uh, far reaching in, 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 in concept. And uh, you know, we do have a, a strategic plan that says we're better together and that's important to bring knowledge and worldviews together. Um, but I think that Kim had the prescience to seize this very important moment. And I would like to thank her and also thank all of our speakers, uh, Drs. Arjuman Siddiqui, Dr. Jeffrey Morgan, and Michael Stettner for coming together today with us to share your thoughts and insights. And so with that, I'm very happy to now introduce Kim McGrail, a professor in the School of Population and Public Health and Director of Research at UBC Health. And Kim will 
guide us from here on in. So thanks very much, Kim. Thank you so much, Dermot, so for the um, lovely opening remarks and kind comments. Um, and, uh, and thank you all for taking the time to be with us for this launch today. Uh, the, this program has been, as Dermot alluded to, some time in the making, and I'm so thrilled and to be here with my ex excellent colleagues to get this underway. So as Dermot notes, this launch is about today's talk, um, but it's also about a new funding opportunity to support interdisciplinary collaborations. And I'll return to that, but for now, I'd, I'd like to just introduce my partners for today's presentation, and I'll do this in the order in which you'll hear them speak. And their bios, I'm gonna, as I'm gonna say them, will be brief, but there are longer versions on our website. So Arjuman Siddiqui is a social epidemiologist and professor and division head of epidemiology at the Dalai Lama School of, of Public Health at the University of Toronto, where she holds the Canada Research Chair in Population Health Equity. Her research centers on understanding why health inequalities are so pervasive and persistent and what can be done about this with an emphasis on the role of societal conditions. In recent years, one focus of her research has been on examining the causes of contemporary trends in population health and health inequalities. And you'll hear more about that today. She also engages with government, governmental and non-governmental entities, including the government of Ontario, the government of, of Canada and the World Health Organization. Uh, Arjuman is someone I've always admired, but this is the first time we've had an opportunity to work together. And I'm so grateful for this. Michael Stepner is an assistant professor in the Department of Economics at the University of Toronto as of about two weeks ago. Uh, his research examines the relationship between health and economic inequality with a focus on how public policy can improve the health and financial security of low-income populations. Michael received his PhD from MIT in 2019 and his dissertation research was awarded the top dissertation award from the National Academy of Social Insurance. After hearing him speak, I am, um, suspect you'll be as pleased as I am that we have him back here in Canada. And Jeffrey Morgan is a Vanier Scholar and PhD student in the School of Population and Public Health and has a master's in geography. His research uses community-based and participatory approaches that meaningfully involve community members and patient partners at every step of the research process particularly on projects that advance health equity for people who use substances and sexual minority people. Jeff just finished the first year of his PhD program, which was without question an odd return to school life, but he's really jumped in with both feet and it's been such a delight to work with him. Okay, so with that, I'll provide a bit of an introduction and context setting for today's talk and, and the Health After 2020 series more generally, and then we'll hand things over to Arjuman. And there will be time for questions after the formal part of this presentation. So as Dermot has already alluded to, we're in, a, in the middle of a period of time um, that will likely be viewed as a watershed, as a, a turning point that create, created lasting change in society. We collectively should recognize the possibilities of this moment and seize the opportunity to influence the direction of change in ways that will support population health and eliminate health inequities. The last year put a spotlight on, the, on a number of existing social societal issues and accelerated the pace of change in others and created some new ones too. Maybe I'll just get this going here. Um, Examples include how we care for older adults, whether education is meeting everyone's needs and the effects of systemic racism. Societal issues, however, are just that. They are not unalterable forces of nature, they're choices. They're the results of the institutions, structures and policies that form our communities and our provincial and national identity. They both reflect and help shape norms, culture and our relationships to one another. Collectively, they articulate, however implicitly or explicitly, the social contract that either ties us or divides us. The opportunity then is to consider whether our current structures and policies are the right ones for now and for the future. Our understanding and approach to health is one of the ways into this collective conversation. Thinking through what the experience of the last year means for health and health equity can help create a research agenda and ultimately a policy agenda. So the purpose of Health After 2020 as a program is to advance these discussions, 
define new research collaborations, and ultimately develop interdisciplinary and community-informed evidence that can address health and health equity. So our conversation today is just the starting point. We'll identify some particular challenges and issues with current structures and policies. These are meant to illustrate and to open a dialogue that we hope is inviting and that will, without question, uh, be amplified and expanded uh, on what you hear today. So with that in mind, um, today we have identified a series of questions that we might ask to inform a purposeful and inclusive response to coming out of the period of the pandemic. The questions we will address are, first, what do we mean by health, health inequities, and health inequalities? Second, what are the structures and policies would we put in place in order to, to support or promote health, and how effective are they? And third, who has the power to shape structures and policies, and whose interests do those structures and policies serve? So before asking our other speakers to address these questions, I'll provide just a little bit more context. Oops. So the immediate and uh, social and economic context is the, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic and its particular uh, and unusual broad and concurrent effects in many places. The fact that we were all experiencing what we hope is a once in a lifetime event created an opportunity for reflection. It gave space for people to see and pay attention to other things that have been going on for some time. There was in fact a moment of shared vulnerability, a feeling that we are all equally at risk from the effects of COVID. Reality, however, quickly showed us that the social patterning of COVID began to look like so many other health conditions with greater risk associated with occupation, with income, with housing, and with race. And that these risks are of course related and compounding or intersectional. Conversations over the last several months are the first signs of broad public recognition that these inequalities and large inequities are systemic and structural, with stories, for example, of some children thriving in a tech-enabled learning environment, while others try to learn using a phone as the only device available, or while sitting on a curb outside a fast food restaurant because of lack of internet connections in the home. Another part of the existing context is that we are in a time of rapid change driven by digital technology. And this of course predated COVID. Everything can be turned into data and data are then used for just about every aspect of our everyday lives. This rapid change, likely fundamental transition has been described as the fourth industrial revolution. The first three industrial revolutions took us through mechanization, mass production and automation. The fourth is a bit different in that it's beginning to blur the lines between physical, digital, and biological spheres. The fourth ind industrial revolution has implications for all aspects of society, from work to education, cities, the climate, and global relations. Much has been written about the digital divide, but this may quickly be grow to be a digital chasm. Examples of this during the last year relate to who has access to technology to enable working from home, or in the case of children, learning from home. The inequalities are stark. So with all of that background and a reminder of our three framing questions, I will hand things over to Arjuman to help address the first of these questions. Thanks so much, Kim. And um, uh, there we go. Um, I just need to take a moment to just reiterate uh, Dean Keller's uh, kind comments about Kim. Don't take my word for it, but the late, great Clyde Hertzman held uh, Kim in incredible esteem. So I'm really grateful to have a chance to work with her. Um, okay, so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about three examples that I think uh, highlight part of what Kim's talking about. Um, and the first is that health inequalities are sadly uh, a defining feature of the way population health is organized. We've kind of gone through decades of evidence now that says essentially, not only is this WHO framework uh, on social determinants of health, but it's really a framework on population health. And that is to say that really health at, at its core is organized by a set of proximal, proximal mechanisms from behaviors to epigenetic processes that themselves are shaped 
uh, expressed constrained by social forces. And so the social inequalities we see and the reason for them being so widespread and pervasive and persistent is that that's how health is basically fundamentally organized. Um, but what's happened recently is a recognition that not only do we have health inequalities, but they're actually getting uh, worse. This is data from actually Dr. Stepner and his colleagues on the left from the US and from uh, my former uh, PhD student Faraz Vahid Shahidi and uh, uh, a few of us on the right with Canadian data. And you can see that over time uh, across income groups represented by the different colors, life expectancy has grown for everyone uh, but the biggest gains have come to the top income brackets. And so effectively what you get is what Clyde Hertzman might call a fanning out effect so that uh, you, the inequality is growing over time, even though there have been gains to everyone. And the, the, the inequality uh, across income groups growing is something that I think we need to really pay attention to and think about. So uh, Dr. Vahid Shahidi did another study as part of his dissertation where he zeroed in on these rising inequalities and he looked specifically at employment related inequalities. And so if you look at that bottom dashed line, that is the prevalence of poor self-rated health for people who are employed over about a 15 year period. The top line with confidence intervals is uh, uh, the percent of people reporting poor self-rated health who are unemployed. And so you can see that this gap between the employed and the unemployed has grown and it's a function of worsening health amongst the unemployed. And when we try to decompose the sources of this growing trend, uh, we could really only account for about 13% of the growing gap in inequality using the kinds of variables we routinely use in public health. Everything from demographics to behaviors to even some socioeconomics like income. Our original hypothesis is that this is probably about income, but we simply couldn't explain what was happening with traditional forces. And our hypothesis at this time is that the actual context of unemployment has changed over time. The precarity associated with uh, unemployment, the relationship between unemployment and the welfare state, the sort of institutions around the labor market and around social policy have changed to a degree that isn't identifiable with our traditional variables and may be explaining why inequality is growing over time. The second example I want to give uh, is about um, a, a finding that we had that was extremely curious recently and again challenge us challenges us to think about health inequality perhaps in different ways. And this comes from a phenomenon that's been identified by Anne Case and, and Angus Deaton um, on rising mortality among whites in the US who are traditionally not the more disadvantaged group. They tend to have the best health uh, in the US. And in about a 15 year period from about 1999 to 2013 or so, um, there is a, a, an observation that actually white mortality was increasing while the mortality of other racial groups was not increasing. In fact, it continued to decline in that time as mortality tends to do in high income countries. And so the question was, how could it be First of all, that you have rising mortality uh, that's not coinciding with the recession, it's not coinciding with some major event, and it's happening amongst the more privileged group. And um, there's been a lot of speculation about what might be causing this, everything from declining median income during this time, so all of the negative economic forces that have been operating over the last several decades, what many call neoliberalism, may account for um, rising white mortality. The problem with that explanation is that the other racial groups are experiencing those same forces and to a greater extent. So we did a study where we try to understand whether uh, part of what's happening is something that the social psychologists and the political scientists have observed, which is that uh, whites are experiencing a certain form of status threat. Uh, 
So their status in absolute terms has declined, but they're maintaining a relative advantage because everyone's status has declined over time. And yet they perceive perhaps that their status is, is uh, their, their status advantage, their relative advantage is shrinking. And in fact, there's political science literature to suggest this accounts for things like the formation of uh, uh, the uh, 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 sort of anti-Obama sentiment um, after he was elected. Uh, that it accounts for uh, Trump being elected. That if you ask people, why did you vote for Trump? They tend not to say because of economic reasons, but because of uh, immigrant threat, too much globalization and so on. So on the left uh, is a, a, a figure of the distribution of white mortality over time at the county level. And so you can see over this period during which white mortality increased uh, on average, that there was kind of a distributional shift of white mortality at the county level. And on the right is uh, the shift amongst counties in Republican vote share, which was what we used to proxy for this status threat. And I'm happy to answer questions about that, but it essentially comes from a psychological literature and a political science literature that suggests as whites become more status anxious, they tend to become more conservative in their voting. And so uh, there may be many reasons to be uh, uh, a conservative voter or a Republican voter, but that change, that shift in the proportion of voters tends to be uh, at least partly about this kind of status threat phenomenon. So when we looked at the results uh, of um, the association between status threat as measured by Republican vote share and white mortality, accounting for all the variables you see at the bottom there, we, we did not skimp on uh, looking at confounding variables. Um, this variable of Republican vote share held up the best uh, of all the variables that we looked at. I think there were one or two others that, that rivaled it, but median income, employment, none of the typical variables, none of the typical social determinants we look at uh, have the explanatory power of this status threat variable. And so what we're hypothesizing is that some of the populist sentiment, some of the racial angst that we're seeing in society today is not only affecting policing, voting, et cetera, but it's actually seeping into health as well. So the third um, phenomenon I, I just wanna point out quickly is this idea that in some ways, um, the COVID-19 pandemic did highlight things, but it's stunning that that it highlighted things because we've been talking about social determination of health for a very long time. And so the fact that knowing all this information, we still stood by and watched inequality transpire, I think has something to be said for itself and something to be understood. This is a map of the distribution of COVID across Toronto neighborhoods. And uh, in Toronto, approximately 80% of COVID cases occurred in neighborhoods that are predominantly black and brown. There was like a, a close to tenfold difference between poor black neighborhoods and rich white neighborhoods, a very stunning inequality for a virus that is transmitted by breathing air uh, that has virus in it. And so um, you can imagine uh, how significant and how deeply entrenched inequality is for this to happen. This is a study by Rao and colleagues that shows uh, another slice of this, which is that uh, if you looked at the proportion of essential service workers across neighborhoods, the proportion of essential service workers was correlated with uh, higher COVID cases and higher uh, COVID death rates. And so, uh, you know, unsurprisingly, COVID panned out in the way that this framework predicts, which is that socioeconomics predicted the mechanisms being exposed to the aerosolized virus, predicted the mechanisms that cause COVID, which then caused COVID outcomes. And so I think it's worth reflecting on how and why it is that we are here again with a, a brand new disease when this has been uh, on the tips of our tongues uh, for quite some time, and I'll leave it there. It's over to you, Michael. And thank you, Kim, for organizing this entire uh, this entire group. It's fantastic that you're bringing together 
um, diverse researchers. And as an economist, I'm honored to be uh, a part of a group of population health researchers, public health researchers who are thinking so deeply about the impact of COVID-19. So let me talk a little bit about uh, looking forward from 2020 and patching the social safety net. Because COVID-19, I think, not only created inequality in its impacts, but in fact, it magnified existing inequalities, pre-existing inequalities that uh, economists, epidemiologists, population health researchers have been discussing for years. And so this pandemic has disproportionately harmed both the health and the job security of the already vulnerable. So just to take mortality, for example, in Canada, Mortality rates in 2020 were 8% higher than in 2019. That's from Statistics Canada numbers. But that 8% was by no means 8% higher for everyone. So if you're an older Canadian, you are much more likely to be infected and to die from COVID-19. And in particular, Kim mentioned the social patterning of uh, COVID-19 infections. Infection rates have been 1.5 to five times higher in the racialized populations of Toronto and Ottawa. Those are two cities that actually gathered the data on the uh, racial distribution of COVID-19 infections. And so we know just how unequal those infections were. Moreover, infection rates were 70% higher among First Nations living on reserve than in the general population. And so vulnerable Canadians were disproportionately likely to be infected with COVID. Now, that is likely true across the income distribution as well. We have data from Belgium, uh, from work by Johannes Spinowin and colleagues, which showed that excess deaths were twice as high in the bottom income decile than the top income decile. I think you would find similar patterns in Canada or the United States or other Western uh, European countries. We just don't yet have the data to measure that here in Canada. So both on along the economic dimension and among, along racial and uh, age dimensions, COVID-19 has been affecting the vulnerable. And so it's worth thinking about how those effects have been shaped by institutions. Because institutions, and we as a group, have taken a broad view of institutions. These are, um, these are policies and not just deliberate government policies, but also the practices of labor markets, of businesses within society that are shaping inequality uh, in the present and how those inequalities evolve over time. And so if we think about institutions, in my talk, I'm going to focus on two broad segments of institutions. The first would be tax and transfer policy. And here I mean both the social safety net things like social assistance or employment insurance in Canada. We also had new social safety net programs like CERB, uh, which were designed to try to patch holes in, uh, in the social safety net where people were falling through the cracks at the beginning of the pandemic. Additionally, there are a number of universal services such as public housing, long-term care, Medicare here in Canada, uh, that are essential to understanding inequality in during the COVID-19 pandemic and going forward. Now, those are all sort of government programs, things that we think the government directly uh, has control over and could reform as needed. I think the pandemic has also highlighted the effect that labor markets have on both the health and economic well being of workers. And so if we think about on the job benefits, such as sick pay, uh, job safety, such as the ability to work from home or an employer's willingness to uh, change the layout or the uh, infrastructure around a job, um, as well as job stability, just whether or not somebody believes that they'll have a job next week, whether they know they'll have hours next week, uh, all of these factors affected people's vulnerability before the pandemic and continued to, it, to a greater extent during COVID-19. And so I think as a broad framing mechanism, it's worth thinking about how COVID-19 has highlighted and exacerbated inequalities throughout the life course. And I'm gonna focus on three examples from working age adults and how COVID-19 accelerated shifts in the labor market that were already uh, ongoing before the pandemic how COVID-19 has disrupted the education of children and really 
um, for elderly Canadians ha who have long had a desire to age in place and live in dignity when they're in care settings, I think COVID-19 has highlighted some of the ways that we've been letting them down for a long time. And so to take some data from uh, the working age adults, here I have US data on the change in employment rates at different levels of the income distribution. And so here, if we look at the bottom 25%, there was a massive drop at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, followed by quite a quick recovery and then complete stagnation from the middle of last summer. And so the recession in terms of employment for low income workers has really not uh, recovered throughout that 12 month period from last summer to this summer. And that's a big difference between lower income workers and high income workers. So at the very beginning of this pandemic, we had this feeling we're all in it together, everyone's suffering. And indeed everyone was suffering to different extents, but um, even in the top 25% of workers, there were 4 million jobs lost in the United States. But by June 10th, the recession had pretty much ended at the top of the income distribution. Everyone's, uh, every, the number of jobs paying high wages in the US had returned to pre-pandemic levels. While for the bottom of the income distribution, you had 22% more Americans unemployed than before the pandemic. And one question that this has raised is like, whether this is just due to differences in the industries. And the answer that uh, I've developed with uh, my co-authors is really that it isn't. So if we look at retail trade, for example, these are retail workers, retail uh, spending, actually, you know, there was that blip at the beginning of last year when everyone was stockpiling toilet paper, and then a big drop as everyone stayed at home, not even venturing outside. And then from that point on, people had really cut back on services. They're not going to the gym, they're not going out to bars and restaurants. But when it came to buying goods, retail uh, spending actually recovered very quickly and employment among high income workers recovered quickly as well, while low income workers in the retail trade sector continued to suffer large employment losses throughout the pandemic. And so that raises the question of how do we protect these people from the income losses that they experience? In past work uh, here in Canada I can tell you that layoffs have long-term effects on the employment of workers. So here we're looking at data from 2003 through 2010, people who were laid off earlier in this uh, century, last decade, and their losses were largest in the year that they were laid off, but continued to be substantial in the subsequent years. And their sources of insurance are actually quite broad. And so when we think about where do they get insurance, more than 40% of their lost income is replaced. But over the long term, only a small part of that comes from employment insurance, our formal form of insurance for layoffs and employment losses. Much of that comes from other transfers, such as social assistance, as well as progressive taxation. And so I would encourage people to take a broad view of the sets of institutions, the types of uh, social safety net, that can protect people against those long-term income losses, especially as COVID-19 has accelerated some of these changes in labor markets, where you've seen shifts in employment from small businesses to large businesses, where small local businesses have been closing down, while large businesses like Amazon have been posting record profits. An increase in automation has also happened as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic has sort of accelerated that pre-existing trend. And so it's worth taking the broad view of how to ensure those losses. Now, to wrap up, I also want to look at how COVID-19 has affected both children and the elderly. I think Kim already mentioned a nice example of how COVID-19 has disproportionately affected low-income students who are less able to access online education. Here I have data from an online platform called Zern, which was already integrated into school curricula for 1 million students in the United States. And before the pandemic, whether they were in a low-income or high-income school, students were proceeding at the same pace. They fell dramatically uh, both in high income and low income schools, but high income students sort of recovered to their pre existing learning patterns, while low income students never did, even toward the end 
of this past fall semester, and I now have data through the spring semester, you see the same pattern. And so this is a case where a one-time event could have lasting effects throughout, um, throughout generations. And finally, in elder care, I think the 80% of deaths in Canada have affected elderly Canadians. There have been massive outbreaks in long-term care settings. And this has prompted both a demand for changes to the long-term care uh, system that was letting people down even before the pandemic, but also a demand for uh, a greater ability to age in place, to age uh, at home and uh, remain at home without going into a care setting. And so I think in all three of these cases, we see how COVID-19 has highlighted pre-existing inequalities and generated conversations around how we can address these inequalities going forward. I'm going to leave it there and pass the mic to Jeffrey Morgan. Thank you so much, Kim and Arjamind and, and Michael. It's been such a pleasure uh, working with you all. And thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here today. So I'm gonna be speaking to the third question that Kim raised, which I, which I agree will be critical um, in, in doing this work, which is to reflect on who has the power to shape the structures and the policies um, some of which we've been discussing today that inform our public health response and really in whose interest uh, do they serve or put more bluntly we need to reflect on what our policies and our practices say about whose health and whose expertise matters and this is important because in order to meaningfully address population health inequities we need to identify and dismantle the systemic biases and power structures that have informed our public health response to date uh, so in addition to identifying evidence of biases and inequities, we also need to be thinking about who gets a say in policy decision making in the first place. And thankfully, this work has already begun, especially in BC. These questions um, of whose health and whose expertise matters have been thoughtfully addressed in the In Plain Sight report and review conducted by Dr. Mary Ellen trapel Lafond and the Grandmother's Perspective report about disaggregated demographic data from the Office of the BC Human Rights Commissioner and Kasari Govinder. To continue this conversation in the context of health after 2020, today I will use examples from our public health response to COVID and the overdose epidemic to consider how social marginalization and our normative values and judgments about substance use have accelerated health inequities and adverse health outcomes for people who use illicit drugs in BC. And throughout, I'll be returning to these questions of whose health and whose expertise matters. So as someone who conducts research with people who use illicit drugs in the context of an overdose epidemic, 2020 and our response to COVID immediately put into focus at least the potential for action in the face of a health crisis, which was made evident when we witnessed an unparalleled mobilization of public health resources and a sense of urgency in coming together over COVID. So this slide here shows drug toxicity deaths in BC by month and it's data from the BC um, coroner service and it indicated when the public health emergencies were declared for the overdose epidemic and for the COVID pandemic in April of 2016 and March of 2020 respectively. And you can see by the time the public health emergency for COVID was declared, we were nearly four years into the overdose epidemic and the shaded portion represents the nearly 5,000 people who died of drug toxicity within that time. Since COVID and until the most recent data are available, there have been additional 2,423 deaths attributed to drug toxicity. And this includes several months of the highest number of drug toxicity deaths ever recorded in, in the province. And as one metric to compare our two responses, we can plot overdose deaths against drug toxicity deaths in BC. So over the course of the COVID public health emergency, which has now ended, thankfully, there were 1,756 reported deaths attributed to, to, to COVID as of May 2021, although this number could be much higher. And this is in contrast to the 6,710 deaths attributed to drug toxicity over the course of the overdose public health emergency, which is still ongoing and into its fifth year. We now need to ask ourselves, why hasn't there been even remotely as much attention paid by decision makers, people in power and the public in responding to this ongoing public health emergency. And unfortunately, I think we can gain some insight 
um, by looking at the very top. So in one of the many press conferences held during the COVID pandemic in June of 2020, the Premier of BC, John Horgan, was asked about this stark contrast in public health response to, to COVID and the overdose epidemic. And just to add some context, June 2020, which I've highlighted on the chart here, was a time when COVID cases and death in the province were low and drug toxicity deaths in the province was the highest it had ever been. And in response, he said, quote, we have an insidious virus that affects anyone at any time. And we have an opioid crisis that involves people using drugs. These are choices initially and they become dependencies. He later apologized for these words, but these words are absolutely indicative of not only the collective ownership we have over COVID, but also the normative values and judgments and social marginalization that I believe has informed our public health response to the overdose crisis. Because substance use was perceived by many as a choice, this somehow justifies a difference in the urgency to which we respond to a health crisis. In other words, it was not about simply the number of people dying, but also who is dying that informs our public health response and motivates action. And it's not just about an inequitable response and the values and the judgments that are articulated in our actions and the choices we make. It's also about who is given a voice in making in, the, in decision making and the unexpected consequences and harms that can arise when the public or communities who are on the receiving end of public health policy are excluded from the process. And this answers the question of whose expertise matters. And here there are many examples of way we have failed to consider or address the ways that our public health response to COVID uniquely affected people who use, who use illicit drugs in BC and exacerbated this existing public health crisis. So for example, border closures made the drug supply even more unstable and dangerous. Harm, many harm reduction services like some overdose prevention sites were temporarily closed and reopened with reduced capacities. Meanwhile, liquor stores and cannabis dispensaries rightfully remained open as essential businesses. Social distancing policies and visitor restrictions in some residences um, resulted in more people using substances alone. And while not all these externalities or harms may have been anticipated, the community knew in no uncertain terms that many of these policies would mean that more people would die of drug toxicity. And the image on the slide is from a CBC News headline from April of 2020, which reads, uh, don't use drugs alone, health experts say, even with physical distancing guidelines in place. And this headline not only encapsulates how the public health advice for COVID and the overdose epidemic is conflicting, but also highlights that even after all these direct actions that were taken to address COVID, many of which made things worse for people who use illicit drugs, the public health response to the overdose epidemic four years in continued to be don't use alone. When policies were put in place to mitigate some of these harms, people who use illicit drugs, again, were not meaningfully included in the process, resulting in ineffective policy response. So a recent example is the Vancouver model of decriminalization, which set threshold or proposed thresholds for the possession of criminalized substances. However, people with lived or living experience using those substances were not consulted in the proposal, which they identified as setting thresholds that were far too low and result in a substantial number of people still being criminalized for use. And this begs the question of whose expertise matters, as despite people with lived or living experience using substances not being consulted until after the policy or the proposal was submitted to Health Canada, the Vancouver police, on the other hand, were meaningfully included in these conversations since the beginning. Public health researchers also have a role to play. The BC Centre on Substance Use, where I'm affiliated, provided the data to help inform this policy. Here again, the professionalized experience of substance use researchers, not unlike myself, were valued and considered over the experiences of people who'd be directly affected by these policy decisions. And at the end of the day, members of the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users, or VANDU, I think said it best on a recent panel. And to paraphrase, they said, it's up to each of us to look around the room when policy decisions are being made and to see who's missing. And it's up to us to make sure that these voices are represented, even if it means using our own presence as leverage. So just, just to close, as, as articulated by Kim and, and Arjmand and, and Michael, health outcomes and inequities broadly are the result of choices and policies that 
articulate, however implicitly or sometimes very explicitly, the values and the priorities and the biases of those making decisions. And with regard to the health of people and communities who rely on the toxic drug supply, a comparison of a response to COVID and the overdose epidemic offers a clear and frankly somewhat disturbing picture of these values and priorities. And ultimately the choices, including the choice not to act in some circumstances has illustrated whose health and whose expertise has mattered up until this point. And of course, these lessons extend far beyond the health of people and communities who use substances. In addition to stigma and social marginalization and our normative judgments about substance use, we also need to examine how white supremacy or racism or colonialism, patriarchy, cis heterosexism and other forms of biases inform our structures and our policies and our practices that have a profound effect on the health of our communities. In order to make more just health policy that reduces health inequities and improves the health of our communities, we need to look around the room and ask ourselves whose voices are missing. And this will ensure that all of our diverse communities feel and know that their health and their expertise matters. Um, and that's my hope at least for, for health after 2020 and, and hope that um, you all take on this work as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. And um, I will, I do want to um, leave some time for questions. So I'll just say a couple things while you're getting your questions together and you can feel free to um, raise your hand or um, to put a question in the chat if you wish. Um, I, I think what you've heard today is that um, we have existing health inequalities, some of which have actually been getting worse over time and some limited understanding of how those are produced and reproduced, except it's very clear that they are reproduced very easily, for example, in a new disease like COVID. And that we really need to start thinking about structural as, a, as a, in addition to the social determinants of health. There's lots of structures and policies and institutions we can use to address these things, uh, like the tax and transfer policies, like, like the labor market, educational policies, and of course, health and social policies. And, and, the, and we really do need to consider whose uh, expertise and voices are included in um, both the research and policy development and all of this. So there's, a, I think, an, an enormous opportunity for us to take some collective action and collective ownership of these issues. Um, and this is, again, part of the reason for the program of Health After 2020 to encourage interdisciplinary work and to advance some of the issues uh, that have been raised today. Um, so with that, I'm really happy to open it up um, for uh, questions, if anybody has one that they would like to pose to any of the panelists. Excuse me, ma'am, I pose a lot of comments on the chat box. Yeah, I, I saw that, uh, Ken. And it, did you want to um, just pick a, a quick one and pose a particular question or just uh, draw people's attention to the comments that you've provided? Well, the, the, the most difficult question for me to answer in, in, my, in my life is, why can't we cut off the supply? You know, what is the problem with cutting off the supply? Why some country can cut off supply? And why in Canada, United States, we cannot cut off the supply? Like if you have drug addiction in, in, in uh, Asian countries, you know, you, you, you will be shot. You know, I'm not advocating, you know, that kind of extreme measures. But, is there some kind of corruption here that, you know, there's no unlimited supply of drugs? So thank you for that. I, I think you raised a, uh, it's a fairly complex question because it goes both to um, the, some of the causes of, of addictions, but also some of the underlying um, st structural issues. So I don't know um, if, if anybody wants to um, even pretend to start an answer to that, which I think would probably take a whole other um, seminar, but it's, it, it's an important kind of um, question, but I think I would broaden the frame a bit. Well, I, sorry to, to, to follow up. I think we have been avoiding this question for a long time. You know, we, we've been studying, you know, how, how uh, should we do in, in, uh, in uh, 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 keep on supplying drugs and keep on reducing overdose, but, we, we never have any real thinking about cutting off the drugs. You know, there's, there's no government policy, there's no, no uh, inquiry, there's no research into really cutting off the drugs. You know, if you don't have money, yeah. you can't buy anything. If you don't have drugs, you can't die. 
No, thank you. Thank you for your input. Um, are, are there other questions, comments from anyone? Okay, um, here's a question for any presenter. Um, what policies should we change or um, do you have any places to start? And this comes from um, Barb, one of our um, faculty colleagues at the U um, UBC Okanagan. So it's a, it's, a, it's a hard question, but a good one. What's the starting point? I'd be happy to start with uh, two that have received a lot of discussion during the pandemic, and one would be sick pay and the other is elder care. So sick pay as you know, many, as a faculty member, uh, most white collar uh, workers have pretty good sick pay benefits. You're able to stay home from work when you're sick. Whereas most workers in uh, blue collar jobs uh, do not have such benefits. If they aren't able to work, they both aren't paid and may in fact lose their job uh, somewhat immediately. And so thinking about what we owe each other in society in terms of per job protections and paid leave for sickness became especially salient when there's a transmissible virus circulating, but remains relevant even if everyone is vaccinated against COVID. There's still a flu that circulates every single year. Um, and a whole variety of uh, illnesses that people just deserve some protection against. And so thinking both as a society, as a community of people within the workplace, should we have our coworkers coming into work sick? And then how do we finance that? Does it come from the government? Does it come from employers? I think opens up a whole complicated institutional design question. But I think making sure that there's a greater access to the ability to stay home from work uh, while sick uh, is an imperative right now and going forward. And I'm going to leave it there without getting into elder care because we uh, we don't have a ton of time left in this conversation. Thank you, Michael. And I, maybe I'll direct um, uh, Arjuman if you want to pick up a, on a somewhat related question, which is about how do we build mechanisms to protect the most vulnerable. Um, but also, if you think about pushing upstream, how do we help people from not becoming so vulnerable or falling behind in the first place? Like, what would you have anything you'd like to add on that? Sure. Yeah, I guess uh, it does cover kind of both questions in a way. I've been really persuaded by a bunch of economist colleagues in the U.S. who really think that the ticket to all of this is to address wealth inequality and that uh, income inequality is certainly important, but it's essentially wealth and intergenerational transfers of wealth that um, spur a lot of the opportunity people have. So if you look at the causes of the black white wealth gap, for example, in the US, it's largely driven not by education, not by income, but by intergenerational transfers of wealth, meaning mom and dad and grandma and grandpa uh, passing down money to their parents and grandparents to give them funding for education, a down payment on a home early in life, and so on and so forth. And so I've been fairly persuaded, even though I spent most of my time thinking about income and taxes and transfers and so on in that way, I've been fairly persuaded that until the wealth gap is addressed, it's going to be very difficult to do anything. So in my estimation, bold policies that address wealth are probably a big way to change the vulnerability equation. Thank you. I also point out that um, Stuart Kenner um, put a, a very provocative and interesting comment in the um, in the chat about the fact that um, the, the contrast that Jeff was making between um, COVID deaths and the opioid uh, crisis comes not to, doesn't come down to, but can be differentiated by the fact that one is an infectious disease and the other is is not. Um, so Jeff, I don't know if you want if you have any quick things you want to say. You might want to just pick up that conversation with Stuart. Yeah. Okay. Well, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I, it's a great, it's an important point. I, I think 
I just wanted to say that I think it's important to apply the same urgency that we've applied to, to COVID um, to, to the overdose epidemic as well, given the number of deaths that we've seen. And they're, they're gonna require different solutions, but it's a difference in the sense of urgency that I think really, um, really matters here. Great, thank you for that. Okay, Veronica, I'm gonna ask if you wanna put up the last couple slides because I'm mindful of the time and I do want to just draw people's attention back to the fact that one of the reasons for our, um, our session today is the launch of this new program, which is a funding program open to faculty at UBC, both the Vancouver and Okanagan campuses. So this is, um, it's a relatively, well, it's, it's a circumscribed amount of funding. It's it's not meant to, to um, for you to conduct a whole research project, but it's meant to encourage new interdisciplinary uh, relationships, collaboration, to write a paper, to put a grant together, to, um, a, we're very open to ideas that you might have about how to push some of these conversations forward and how to bring new evidence to bear that will challenge some of the um, some of the ways of the old normal so that we can actually take this opportunity as Dermot described at the at the top of the hour and really embrace um, and help affect a new normal that will address some of these ongoing um, structural systemic issues. So the call for proposals is open now. There's information on our website and we are gonna have a, a Q&A session um, on July 26 and uh, that we'd invite anybody to if you have questions or, or um, whether it's uh, just wanting to hear more about the program program or wanting to understand whether the idea that you have been percolating might be relevant and a good fit for this. So um, thank you so much for all of your attention and coming today. Uh, I um, really appreciate you being here and I want to thank again my colleagues for uh, just the, the excellent and invigorating conversations we had in preparing for this and putting together such a wonderful program for the last hour. So thank you all very much and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.